Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Construction Site Management, a Lecture 11B. In this second of two lectures on this topic, change and claim management will be discussed. In particular, today we're going to be looking at um, changes and uh, the reality of changes, some misconceptions regarding changes, uh, processes that we need to think about, uh, the updating process and schedules and how that ties into change order management, uh, consequential changes and how they um, may have not fully been considered in the pricing of the original changes and some of the impacts that that has around the change order process. In the previous lecture, uh, we talked about a change order form. I sort of gave an example and how when there's going to be a change should be signed off on, settled wherever possible. So that's a con good contractor is trying to position themselves and deal with the changes as they come up. It kind of becomes a problem when there's a whole pile of changes that have been left towards the end of the project and now you're trying to settle them with the client. Usually you're going to be settling them for pennies on the dollar. Much better to get things signed off and agreed to as you go along. There may be some obviously that uh, may be disputed, uh, but those ones could be settled towards the end if necessary. But you want to have done your best to try to settle things as they go along. It's better for you, it's better for the client, it better understands where their costs are going, and uh, you can have a better, stronger, long-term relationships with clients from taking that sort of tactic or model. Some contractors leave these things to the side and then they just build and then it can sink your whole project towards the end when um, you're not getting that settled out. So changes are a challenging area. Some contractors actually fictitiously believe that they can under, undervalue a project, bid on it low, get in, and then have a pile of changes and then get out with a big profit. Uh, not a good tactic and not a honest tactic, an unethical tactic, and actually very difficult to actually achieve. So they really don't know their numbers in those cases typically and they really don't know how smart clients really are in those cases as well. So um, it becomes problematic uh, and it's, it gives the industry a bad name in a lot of ways. So an example of this, if we put it into numbers, uh, let's say we had a base contract of $2 million. And let's assume that the contractor, to be sure that they're gonna get it, undervalues it at $1.8 million. Um, so in anticipation that they'll be able to get that up above and beyond uh, with uh, change orders and make uh, a profit on it. Well, you gotta remember that every dollar spent, it's not profit. A lot of it is on materials and time and labor. So you've got the direct costs, of uh, the um, work that's going on, the hours of work, the materials involved, and you also have the overhead. Um, the company runs on overhead. You've got a head office, you've got vehicles, you've got phones, you've got all these other things that are overhead costs. So if we take a 20% gross profit, now gross profit, that includes overhead and profit together. On sales, what sort of sales would we need in changes in order to recover that $200,000, right? Um, well, 20% of a million dollars is that $200,000. So you would have to get a million dollars in changes to make up that 200,000. And that's just getting you to the point of um, really break even. It's not really doing much for you in that case. So you'd have to do all that extra work to make that up. So what's the likelihood of you being able to do that with these numbers that I've used here? It's very doubtful, very slim to none. So you would really have to pad those changes like crazy uh, to be able to make that money back. Not likely, not a good tactic, not good for yourself in this industry, not honest, not ethical, and definitely playing the short game, not the long game. Because if I'm a client, I'm never gonna wanna deal with you again. So, but does it happen? All too often, all right, all too often. And when we think about this, we should, this is where understanding how um, financial statements work and how businesses operate and where the numbers are is important too, because these things come into affect your bottom line. And so when we say that uh, we have an income statement, this would be like, what does this contractor do in a year? And so, you know, I've got 600,000, 400,000, 
These are the cost of our project, direct cost, the job cost, the materials, the labor, all the subcontractors, right? This is all amalgamated in here in these small numbers. You could add another three zeros to that if you wanted to, uh, make it 600 million, whatever you, whatever, um, you want, right? Um, so when we look at this, uh, we've got projected, right, and sales, or if we had it, if it's actually occurred, then we subtract off our cost of sales, we're less with that gross income. So that was like that gross profit I talked about in the previous slide. And so then we've got all our overhead expenses, they would all add up. So then we've got our total expenses, we would subtract that off right so from this minus this that's going to leave us with this much income before taxes and then we've only got this much um, uh, income taxes at the end of the day this is what we're left with right from this amount of sales so that's what i'm trying to say when we're talking about um, the previous how much would they have to make up in sales to make up for their gross income if it's at 20 percent as an example they would have to make it a substantial amount back uh, in that money. This one's showing more than 20% in gross income, but uh, it is a substantial amount um, that has to be done. So it's good to understand how that actually looks at an income statement and cost of sales, job costs, uh, overhead, profit. You know, the first thing that goes when things take longer or you have change orders and you're not making up that amount in here is your profit. That's the first thing that goes. The next thing is you don't have enough money to pay for your overhead. So you're doing all this stuff for cost of sales and you're not even paying into your overhead and you're not paying into your um, profit. It's a dead loss. Some companies take projects on to keep everybody busy. But if you're not paying down into your overhead, it's a, it's a sinking ship. Um, so you really need to know where your numbers come from, from an income statement point of view, especially if you run a small business. But it also helps you to better understand, you know, this is our, if we have a change order as an example, this is the direct cost of our change order. But we also have to have certain amount of this if this is coming in to pay our overall business expenses because now we've lost the opportunity of doing something else because we're so busy doing all these changes on our project. Will we be able to pay for our overhead for the year? And then will we have anything less for profit? So we it helps us to determine what our target should be when we are marking up our project. So we have a markup that's based on our cost of sales, right? That we mark up our project so that when we multiply that into that factor, we would at the end of the day, if we reach those sales targets, have covered our overhead and covered our profit. Uh, so changes, we have to make sure that we are also covering our overhead and profit. Some contracts actually will limit your ability to put on overhead beyond a certain amount. Um, so you have to be very careful about how it's structured, what's in the contract, and what you're signing up for, and that you're gonna make sure that changes are also potentially profitable, not that they are going to be a negative to you because changes take time to manage. There's administrative costs, there's back office costs that can also occur. And the longer you're on a project, if you're not getting anything from all the value of those changes, then that's having a negative impact on your ability to do other things, the lost opportunity cost as economics um, would define. So we should have a good understanding of the numbers and these things have impacts in other ways. And we should also think about the fact that, um, you know, if you've undervalued a price, uh, then it's very difficult to get that money back. And that's, you know, consciously, you shouldn't be getting into doing it uh, to try to take advantage of a client. But I also think that it happens unconsciously when you don't protect your own interests, when change orders come up on a project and you don't price them enough that you can effectively sustain your business. So we also, with changes, they are going to affect your ability to do the project in a timely fashion. So they're going to have an impact on how timely you can do your work or how effectively uh, you can come in within a certain time frame. 
And you got to do some analysis. You've got to insert activities into the schedule. You've got to see the impact that it has on the schedule to fully appreciate it because there's a critical path to your schedule. And if there's things that are landing on that critical path, it's either going to extend your schedule or you're going to be working a lot of overtime and weekends to try to ensure that it doesn't. And those have different costs to it. So did you price your changes to include those costs? Uh, we really need to document um, our changes. And it's, it's, if there's a number, we want to have a, a change order log. So we have a numbering system for them. We can track them to see how they are in the areas of completion, what their costs are, what we estimated the cost to be, what the actuals were. And that's very helpful uh, for us to do. And it's going to include the numbering of a change order um, or CO number, if you will, a description, the date. Uh, if we're waiting for it to be approved, if it's basically a proposal for a change order uh, and there's a wait for it to approve, we should put a time limit on the cost for it because what we priced it at today might not be the same in a month from now because if we've already gone ahead and done some work and we close that in and now the client signs off on it, then we got to go back and we got to rework it. Well, we originally priced it that we needed this price within a certain time frame. And now it's outside that time frame that changes the costing so you want to be clear on the um, change order uh, proposal that you expect it to be accepted by this date and if it's beyond that date then the costing will be different uh, you may require an extension to the time frame the client might be really tight on the time frame they might not want an extension so then they might want you to reprice it without it extending the uh, time frame you want to make sure that the subcontractors understand uh, the uh, impacts it may have on the schedule so that if you're getting a costing from them, they don't later on want to send you different costings, which would be very difficult to implement if a uh, client has signed off on it. All right. Um, so status date uh, of uh, when it was determined and when it was accepted. So we need to follow dates much like we talked about with submittal logs that way. So issue of the change orders and then the subcontracts have to be adjusted as well. So it's not just with you, with the client, then it's also with the subcontractors because you're adding work to the subcontractors and that's changing your contract um, uh, with them. Uh, when we think about relief too, with the effect of delays that are occurring um, on a project and how that can be termed in, in relief kind of depends also um, on what's causing the delay and the type of delay. Um, so if we think about an owner caused delay, an owner caused delay is what we call an excusable and compensable delay. So if the owner changes your ability to get access to a certain area and that causes you a delay in the project and has cost implications to that and you can prove it, um, then you can uh, put in for an excusable and compensable delay, which can give you uh, the opportunity to make a change to the contract that would include um, that those costs um, that uh, you're incurring as a result of being there longer. Going back to what I've said in a different class, uh, there's a per diem cost for every day you're on that project, right? So that would definitely come in um, to um, that area. A concurrent delay is gets a little bit uh, more complicated. There wouldn't be costs, so I won't get into that too much right now here, but basically that concurrent delay is where you and the client both cause a delay at the same time. Usually it's not a cost advantage um, to either party, but it is an extension of time. Uh, so owner cause delay, force majeure. Uh, is another one. Force majeure is uh, an unforeseen or unexpected weather event and that's causing an impact on the project. A hurricane comes through, a wildfire, you can't get access to the project for three weeks. Uh, Fort McMurray would be a good example of that. The wildfire a few years back. Um, COVID would be another force majeure uh, event that if it closed down your project for a few weeks, definitely you would get an you know, the opportunity of an extension of time if it's impacting the critical path. Um, contractor cause delay, so that would be, um, that's where you are the problem, not the client. 
and if there's liquidated damages well that would change what the client would owe you so they wouldn't owe you as much if there was twenty five thousand dollars per day ten days two hundred fifty thousand dollars that would lessen your contract amount by that much because you're the cause of the delay um, so when we think about change and claim uh, management um, you want to be able to update your schedule and see what the impacts of the schedule were. So what was the plan and what happened? And if something is changing the time period or changing the critical path, what caused that? Was it something the client or their consultant did? They didn't allow you access to the area. How much did it delay you? It delayed you by this many days, right? Um, so you, you look at that and you try to make a, a judgment then on what the impact is to the overall project and uh, if there are costs that you're incurring as a result of that and you didn't cause it, then you'd be putting in for a change. Be trying to justify it. And there's different ways that you get into this. Um, in this course, I'm not getting into too much detail on this, but um, you can do an analysis. Sometimes you get a mixture of those different delays, like a concurrent delay, an independent delay. That would be, you know, the client's consultant maybe delayed you as an example. So concurrent, it's kind of like you get extra time, but no extra compensation. But if it's independent, you might get um, three, three days um, for this, three working days for this delay that um, the client's consultant cost. Cause. As long as you can prove what those costs are that you're incurring as a result of that. On the other hand, if you caused the delay and it was liquidated damages, you might have that much less off your contract as a result of that. So it would change the amount owing in the contract. So this is how it can be tracked. Um, and of course, you have a change order form that would be filled out, like I showed you in the previous um, lecture, uh, typical... Um, uh, change order to the contract amount and so it's showing um, the contract amount and it's showing it's starting to discuss what the the change is and what the amounts uh, required and if there's savings and there's additions and then it's looking at what the original contract amount is and then it's adding the change order amount to it so then you know the total will be so this is and then it gets signed off by um, the various uh, parties on the project and so a good sort of example of how that would um, lay out there uh, from with some information filled in um, as a result but really you really want to make sure that you who the contract is between right what the contract amount uh, current contract amount is uh, with previous changes added to it and then what the cost of this change is and now what the new contract sum including this change order will be and so then if you have another one after this, it would take this amount and add that much to it again. So uh, each, now a claim, as I've mentioned, is an unresolved change, right? So we want to get the claim to be signed off. So, you know, once we get this signed off, it's no longer a claim, it's a change. We've, we've settled on it, we're good. Um, claim is, this should be changed. And so then it goes into that negotiation and, uh, uh, really, uh, the effects of changes should be included in schedule updates. So when you're doing a monthly update to the client, it should be shown how this potential change is going to impact the project, right? So, you know, before this change, we had no variance. After this change, we have 11 days. Uh, the change is taking 60, 16 days, but it's not impacting the project by 16 days, it's impacting it by 11 days, which means that change had about five days of float, and you can sort of see them over here, where it didn't really impact the project, but then all this stuff did, and it pushed out the rest of the work. That's a good indicator of how the change is impacting um, the project. And that's also a selling feature if you're going into negotiations about the change. You might be saying, this is going to delay the project by 11 days. We want an extension. The client might come back and say, I don't want to change the finish date. What can you do? Then you could price it out, perhaps working weekends and doing other things to not um, take the 11 days. But that would be a different cost. That would be a different cost. Um, so when we think about uh, the term project acceleration, um, this happens and this can be again a change in um, the schedule, a change in the contract, causing a change in the contract. 
You could have voluntary acceleration where the contractors decide, I want to get done sooner. So you've decided that. There could be implications around that because maybe the client doesn't want to take over the project sooner or whatever. And then you have to, I've seen where you have to provide security for a period of time because you finished so much earlier. Uh, but that's a good position to be in, quite frankly. It's not a negative position if you're able to accelerate and that's what you want to do as long as you've thought it through. Uh, directed acceleration occurs when an owner directs uh, to make up for a delay or shorten the duration of project, um, usually within the contract terms, and usually that's a more amicable sort of way of going about it. Um, constructive acceleration occurs when a GC or CM is denied an extension of time, but they're still expected to meet the original project completion date. So there's something that there's a claim in process and uh, the contractor is saying it's going to take longer, the owner's not accepting it, and they still want it at that finish date. Well, the contractor is going to make a decision. I can f accelerate the work to finish on that date. I can do it normal and just pull out, and then hopefully we can settle this claim afterwards and get that resolved. There's different avenues um, to take on that, and that's a business decision that has to be made under those circumstances. Uh, some of the contractual issues... Um, uh, related to um, uh, delays and uh, changes and quite frankly um, work not being followed the way it's supposed to be followed under the uh, contract uh, where we have um, misunderstandings and those kind of implications uh, you know where some work that gets omitted some of the work doesn't uh, occur that was supposed to occur and then that delays um, the project and that can obviously um, cause a change in the contract because now the project is taking longer uh, or uh, varying contracts so that you haven't got clarity so there's a change made it wasn't really um, fully demonstrated between you and the subcontractor uh, so you have varying contract terms and conditions between the owner and between the subcontractor and that can lead to claims from subcontractors, right? Because something, uh, you, you're getting benefiting from a change to the owner, you didn't sign off on the change to the subcontractor, that could be all kinds of problems with that. And as we mentioned, changes to the scope of work, um, uh, then that also is an opportunity when something changes here, and it might not be directly impacting that subcontractor, but you're rescheduling their work as a result of that, they may see it as an opportunity to make a claim um, that they're being delayed and that they're incurring extra costs as a result of the other change and they're not being compensated properly for that. You can make a claim about anything. It's to win on the claim or to get the change to go through. That's another thing. And differing views from differing people, that plays a big part in some of the um, issues that we run into in construction projects because maybe it's legit. Maybe they are being impacted by it, but maybe they're not. Um, so again, that and did you recognize that when you were actually doing the change? And did you account for that in your pricing for the change? Now, if you agree to their change, uh, then what implication does that have to do with the change order you signed off with the owner, right? So um, it gets complicated. And of course, when we talk about quality control, somebody uses a substitution and it's not an approved substitution, then there's a lost value from the client's perspective and they want to credit uh, as a result. Uh, Maybe it doesn't perform as well, or maybe they want rework done as a result of that. It can have all kinds of implications too. So some of the things you can see in this course, we've talked about time, we've talked about cost, we've got talked about quality, we're talking about changes in the contract, and we talked about contract types. These things are all coming together and integrating in a lot of different ways. And so we need to have processes and systems that ensure that we have a way of doing things and dealing with things uh, so that we have fewer of these kind of um, rogue kind of elements occurring, right? And that it's uh, more clear. Doesn't mean we're going to get rid of all of them, but at least we have a mutual understanding of that from the beginning. Um, and as I've mentioned, you know, these are the typical uh, in the previous lecture additions, deletions, uh, changes in the sequencing of the work by the client. Maybe it doesn't allow you into a certain area and you've got to do something a different way. Uh, Changes in the methods, materials, design, unforeseen conditions, uh, schedule changes, impacts from other trades, 
Uh, it could be a, two um, prime contracts. You're working in the same area and you're supposed to get into this area. You can't because they didn't finish their work. Those types of things happen all the time. Uh, changes in owner supplied equipment resulting in changes of what you're supposed to provide. Uh, just uh, some of the examples. And we can uh, categorize um, these into three areas, owner directed, constructive, and consequential changes. So owner directed, pretty good. Most type of change orders, um, they know they're making a change. They wanna add value for whatever it is that they're doing. They're asking you to get a quote and to um, uh, sign off on it really so so that you can get a quote and they'll sign off on it uh, there might be ch it might involve changes in the schedule and the sequence and the cost uh, and you estimate both your direct uh, and uh, indirect costs and whenever possible because we'll talk about this you figure out how it's impacting other parts of the work and how do you figure that out you go back to what i said back here and um you insert the change into the schedule. You get a good idea of what it's impacting and you really look at the site logistics and other impacts to other trades that it may cause so that those consequential changes are um, covered, right? So in the owner directed, as I was mentioning, uh, make sure that you try to cover all those. This is really hard to come back later and win on. Not impossible and, you know, certain the uh, court decisions have allocated for that, especially when you, there's no way that you really could have seen that. Um, but uh, you should do your due diligence where possible because it makes negotiation much better. It's keeping transparency much better. It's playing the long game because clients don't want to have surprises later down the road. Think of yourself. You go and you, you get something done and then they want to add extra charges for something. Well, auto mechanic they want to do this this and they tell you it's this much and then they do it and they say oh by the way I had to do this at the same time and you're kind of thinking well couldn't you have seen that before right um, so if they could have they would have been much better to have given you a heads up that if this occurs I might have to do this and it would cost this much you would be much more open to that than the surprises that come from your perspective. So when you think about client and construction, it's very similar that way. So uh, that was the owner um, directed. Did I miss one here? Maybe. Um, constructive uh, changes. So yeah, so that constructive changes is um, how basically uh, from a, a point of view, um, the constructive side is really, so the client's really not acknowledging um, that aspect of it. Owner-directed constructive is kind of like it's as a result of something else. It's not owner-directive. It's a result of, oh, there's this unforeseen condition. Oh, there's this, this sort of um, thing that came up. Those happen, right? And the unknown unknowns that we may not have been able to predict. Um, so it's really um, a basis of more dispute because um, really they don't get any benefit out of it. They didn't they didn't ask for it. You're telling them it occurred. And uh, if in some cases, it's because things were missed that should have been, uh, they should have been made aware of. Um, so uh, really, uh, from that point of view, usually clients um, are not thrilled with it. So it's a harder sale. But that means better documentation, better evidence, better explanation, photo documentation, schedule impacts, all of these things help to explain it. Constructive changes uh, where, what I mentioned earlier, where you're trying to see, um, sorry, that's the second one, the I meant consequential. All right, so constructive uh, changes still continuing. Uh, it could be causing all of these things, which could be causing potential for extra costs. Uh, client makes a change, and uh, when you can have access to something, they think it's fine, there's no issues, and then all of a sudden, you're saying, well, that changed our work sequence, so that cost us extra money. They don't see any value in that. They just see a problem that you should have been able to handle. But meanwhile, this problem they created by not letting you have access cost you money. And so that's a constructive um, change. Harder to sell, more resistance. Consequential uh, is that aspect of, well, we're doing this, so then this impacts um, that. Um, so, um, you know, we made this change and because of that, it delayed the masonry work till January. And now we've got to put this hoarding around it and heat it. And this is costing extra money that we didn't expect to spend. Consequential changes. 
okay, we got paid for this change that happened in November, great, but it delayed the work and the masonry work didn't start till January as a result of that and now they got this extra cost. That's a consequent, we wouldn't have had that extra cost if that change didn't occur because they would have done the work in November. Did we price that extra cost into that change or did we only look at that change? And that happens all too often and that sinks you as far as being profitable. So you'd want to change, you'd want to identify that and negotiate that in the original change. You don't want to come back with that later, even though it's true, but you missed it, right? Some of them it's, you know, you don't have a crystal ball and you don't see all the consequential changes, but you want to try to get as many as possible um, involved in that. So really, before the first change order, you want to have a system and a lot of most of the CCDC uh, contracts are going to have or AIA kind of they're going to have a process that you follow for change orders. This is what you do step by step. And within your company, you should have processes and systems that helps you to track your change orders to look at them in a dynamic way so that you see the what's going on with them and you can track how they're proceeding and you're making sure you don't have gaps and things that put you into reactive mode. So in the previous uh, lectures that we did when we talked about digital technology, well, on the front end, building in BIM can help to um, mitigate a lot of changes before the construction st starts. Fewer changes is better, right? So hopefully that's come across in the last two lectures and that we can accomplish by being proactive. Can't always though, because maybe it's a lump sum contract and now you've got it and there's these issues or changes coming about. So you can't always be proactive, um, but if you're in the early stages, like a CM project or a design build project or a in, better yet, an integrated project delivery, IPD project, then you can. You can try to be proactive and mitigate those changes um, early on. So you redu greatly reduce them. Um, that saves a lot of hassle. That saves a lot of problems. That's going to be better for relationships as well and easier to manage and easier to be profitable. As we have discussed how it is a challenge to be profitable. Um, lump sum. So what, are, what is our process? What does the contract say? Do we have systems in place that, that allows us to track, to monitor, and people are aware that works for our company and that we interact with what our process and systems are? Um, that becomes very helpful and you know we can also discuss that in the pre-construction stage with pre-construction meetings with the subcontractors to ensure this is the way we operate and this is how we're going to handle changes and this is the communication process that we need to occur because most of the problems in relationships uh, comes as a result of lack of good effective communication and systems to allow for that those notifications to take place. So change order management is second to labor management in terms of risks on the job site. So when you're into estimating, estimating labor is a challenge and managing it on the project is a challenge because resources don't show up or the quality issues or they don't bring the right resources and there's delays or there's safety. It, it's probably the, it's the most risky, but right next to it is change orders and the effective management of change orders. So um, if you hear somebody boasting about how much money they make on change orders, be a little bit skeptical because it is not easy to do effectively and honestly in this business. And so you really want to um, get good systems, processes and understanding and be a student of this. I think it's a little bit that you're a lifelong student of understanding the processes and systems and understanding the people that you're dealing with, understanding your client. I've mentioned this before this book, uh, how to win friends and influence people. Look at it from the client's perspective. Look at the type of change. This is a change which is a design error. The consultant is not going to be easy to deal with on this. Try to frame it in a way that is not really super negative towards the consultant that's more understanding, but at the same time, really step by step shows you've done your homework and you're not trying to be unethical or unprofessional about it. This is the way you're interpreting it. And listen, listen to their response and be very professional in your handlings of the negotiation. A uh, big part of it is the selling and negotiating of change. 
changes and the building of the relationships in it. It's really, really um, big. It can make the difference between unsettled claims and signed change orders. And if we can get ourselves in a position where we have effectively signed change orders with clients, with subcontractors, and we can do that in a way that is reasonable and is profitable for us, profitable for subcontractors, and not negative to client, adding value to clients as much as possible, as reasonably as possible, then we'll be successful as a company in the long game of construction. So transparency, honesty, working ethically, and having really believing in what you're selling, but not forgetting your bottom line. We talked about the income statement, we know your numbers, and that's important. So hopefully this has gotten across um, these last two lectures, the elements of change order management and claim management. So I'm Tom Stevenson signing off for now, wishing you a wonderful day. Bye-bye.